Today we shall be discussing two aspects of social work. One, the origin and growth of the concept of social work. And in part two, we shall be discussing about the origin and growth of social work education. Now, when we are studying uh, students of uh, bachelor degree in social work, we need to be fully aware of the roots of the origin of uh, this profession. Now, for any person in the street, social work would mean charity. But when you go through the training and education in social work, you will find that social work is much more than charity. Definitely, the origin of the concept of social work emerged uh, voluntarily across the globe in various continents, in various nations. There is contribution from individuals, religious organizations and other like-minded organizations or agencies who have helped in evolving the idea of this profession. We say charity begins at home. When people are faced with the problems, the immediate people who come around to help those in need are the family and the immediate neighbors. And social work by and large begins with the family, then to immediate neighborhood, to the community and to the society at large. Today when we are discussing about the origin and growth of social work, we shall definitely be unfolding a lot of information to you which will help you as you go through the process of studying the bachelor degree program in social work. Now, if we go chronologically, we can find that even in the BC centuries, the idea of uh, helping people was there. Now, in uh, 1750 BC, the then king of uh, Babylonia, Hammurabi, he gave a code of uh, justice to say that helping one another during times of uh, hardship is the duty of every human being. Later, we find that around uh, 1200 BC, the Jewish people were told that God expects uh, them to help people in need. Now, when we come back to our own Asian continent, we find in the analects of uh, Confucius around 300 BC, where uh, it is stated that uh, uh, the analects uh, declared that humans were bound to one another by Jen. Jen means a form of sympathy expressed through helping those in need. Therefore, we find that uh, across the continents, we find uh, the traces of the growth of this particular profession. Again, when we come into the AD centuries, in the beginning of AD, we had Jesus Christ who taught the people that helping one another and loving other people is the will of God. And Jesus said, and he emphasized the need for giving to those who are less fortunate. We also find uh, in the Indian continent, subcontinent, around the year 400 AD, shelter homes were made for the destitutes, for the orphans and the disadvantaged. These were similar to the arms houses which were being built uh, in Europe at that time. Now, this same idea got further expanded to various other countries, particularly in China and the Middle East and Europe, where they also started making shelter homes for those in need, following the example set in India. 
and in 600 AD we have Prophet Muhammad who told that people had an obligation to the poor by paying a zakat and to care for the poor was one of the pillars of Islam. So practically in every religion you find that uh, the concept of helping people to go into the pains of others and to share that and help people to solve their own problems was and is evident in the teachings of various religions. And most of the charity organizations also came up or founded by uh, people who are committed uh, to their own religions. Today, to discuss more about the growth of this profession across the globe and within India, we have two experts from the Central University Jamia Milia here in Delhi from the Department of Social Work. To my right is Dr. Archana Dasi, who is a senior lecturer in social work. And to her right is Professor A.S. Kohli, also from the Jamia Milia Islamia. Both of them will be sharing with us their knowledge about the origin and growth of uh, the concept of social work. So to begin with, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Archana to briefly tell our uh, students about the history of social work from uh, UK. Well, in the primitive society in UK, the concept was same that uh, the family and the tribe would take care of the needy people of somebody who deserved help and would provide them food and shelter and some kind of economic uh, help. But then gradually what happened was that church came into existence and it was church um, which uh, took the responsibility of uh, providing relief to people and uh, people who were well off so that means feudal lords and rich people they would give uh, money uh, in or food or medical help to churches and the clergymen would be uh, responsible for distributing uh, the aid which was given for the have-nots. Gradually the feudal system gave way to wage economy and what happened was that now the responsibility of welfare shifted from the church to the state and uh, in now state became responsible for providing all kind of help and relief to the poor and the needy people. And, uh, in 1350 to 1530, a series of statutes for laborers were um, enacted which were designed to force the poor people to work. And uh, what happened was that these series of measures, they culminated into what was called Elizabethan Poor Law which was, uh, which came into existence in 1601. Now, According to Elizabethan poor law, uh, the poor people were divided into three categories. Uh, first was able-bodied uh, beggars who were also called sturdy beggars and they were put into the workhouses and they were forced to work there. The second was uh, the, uh, the important poor and these were the people who were old, sick, handicapped or um, destitute women. They were the ones who were uh, not in a position to work because of their condition may it be physical or mental or social and they were put into the alms houses and there they were, they were given relief in terms of food, clothes and money or fuel what they actually needed to survive. And the last category was of the dependent children. Now, these were the children who were deserted by their parents or who were orphans or who were destitutes or sometimes even those children who were not uh, in a position where their parents could take care of them. There they were uh, taken by the state and they were put into uh, the, the houses in the towns where they could work as domestic help. This was the kind of category which was uh, uh, delineated by the Elizabethan poor law. And what happened was that public relief was uh, 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 distributed under the governmental responsibility. 
Now, uh, there were a number of uh, uh, changes which were or revisions which were there in the poor law also and one could see that uh, um, uh, there were many people who were really taking advantage of the relief and there then in the revised poor law which came in 1909, uh, the, the, there were certain things which one had to follow. First was that there would be no partial relief given, there will be no relief given to the adult uh, uh, able bodied uh, poor or who were called the sturdy beggars and um, uh, there was no outdoor relief re was also uh, limited. And one, one really uh, could see that uh, uh, following uh, the poor law reforms, the next thing which came was in 1942, the Beveridge report. Now, uh, Sir William Beveridge uh, in 1942, he chaired a committee on social insurance and allied services and he presented a, a report which was meant for uh, the poor people and which were which was primarily meant for the public welfare and one could see that uh, he emphasized on four major things the first thing was that every citizen uh, has to be covered under the social insurance the second thing which he he came up was that there were certain major risks of losing uh, your earning power and that could be accident that could be unemployment or that could be sickness or old age or widowhood and all these should be covered under a single insurance the third thing was um, in, in this uh, um, report that every uh, individual has to contribute equally irrespective of his income. And the fourth thing was that every individual has a right to claim and uh, uh, get a cover insurance cover again irrespective of his income and uh, he, he really uh, has to just qualify for uh, this social insurance and he would get the overall cover from the government. Now, this, this report, the Beveridge report of 1942, this uh, became a foundation of the modern social welfare legislation in UK. They were, uh, Besides, besides these things, there were two other, another things which, which had an uh, important uh, role in uh, emergence of social work in UK and that was uh, the beginning of COS movement. COS is Charity Organization Society. Uh, this started in 1869 and um, it, it it came up in London with a setting up of uh, COS that is Charity Organization Society and it was Octavia Hill who wo ha was uh, having an important role in setting up the COS in London. Now, uh, Octavia Hill was a housing reformer and uh, she had a, a band of a group of volunteers with her uh, who would visit the um, uh, slum areas, who would visit the poor localities and they, they uh, would work there with uh, these people, the poor people. Now, there were certain things which Octavia Hill had um, had uh, set for this these volunteers who were there and that was that every every poor person whom you visit has to be individualized and then uh, there has to be respect for his privacy and his independence one uh, one uh, uh, never has to be judgmental about the poor people and about their behavior and the last thing was that there has to be belief in the worth and dignity of an individual. Well, these were the kind of things which were practiced by Octavia Hill and her volunteers in the charity organization society of uh, London. The last thing which uh, is uh, in the uh, history of uh, social work in UK and that is about the settlement houses. The settlement house movement was started by Samuel Barnett and who was uh, who uh, started the first settlement house um, uh, called Toynbee Hall and there was an attempt that uh, uh, the wealthy uh, students of Oxford University, they were, uh, they came and um, resided with the uh, slum people of Whitechapel and they uh, 
observed them very closely and tried to understand their problems, their miseries and what they were going through because of poverty, because of unemployment, because of sickness and because of various, various problems which they had. Now, the only reason for this was that this was a mutual uh, benefit um, uh, which uh, the poor and the rich could have. It was a, an exposure to both of them towards a different kind of a life and uh, um, they felt that uh, uh, in order to uh, understand underdevelopment and poverty, one needed to live with the poor and listen to them. This was primarily, uh, these were the various kind of uh, things which took place in UK and which all contributed to the emergence of social work in Thank you, UK. Dr. Archana. It was a very good explanation, uh, dear students. Uh, in my introduction, I already spoke about uh, uh, how this uh, concept uh, originated with the idea of charity by individuals, by uh, uh, various uh, religious organizations and the beginning I quoted uh, the king of uh, Babylonia and now in the explanation given by Dr. Archana Dasi, we find that how the king or the emperor and uh, the government in UK was trying to help the poor uh, in uh, addressing their various issues. Now, as I said in the beginning, the concept of social work emerged simultaneously across the globe in various continents. So, social work as usually spoken in most literature, people feel that um, uh, it has emerged only in UK and USA. That is not true. Every continent has. And we have with us Dr. Uh, Professor A.S. Coley who will tell us about the origin and growth of this concept in the Indian context, especially from the ancient and medieval period. Professor Colin. Uh, <coughs> social work uh, is a, uh, as a professional discipline is being practiced across the world, different countries and in different fields. Uh, social work as a profession, if you look into, has uh, uh, started in India. In fact, you know, uh, uh, if you see the history of uh, social work in India, uh, many people have many ways to look at social work and if we, st to start with, it has uh, uh, basically a, a started as a, as a profession, as a helping profession, a profession which helps people in such a way that they can help themselves. It is also a humanitarian profession because it uh, promotes the well-being and the quality of life of the people uh, in the society. When we look into the Indian history and particularly the ancient India, uh, as we have seen in the uh, UK, charity <coughs> and religious devotion as a main stay of the Indian society. Welfare and common good of all is, has been mentioned in various uh, religious scriptures in India. If you look into Dharma Shastras, if you look into Smritis and if you look into various uh, Vedic scripture, scriptures that uh, and I am saying if you if you read Rig Veda, it says that may one who give shine the most. Even Arth Shastra propounded by uh, Kotalya, they say the public good by joint effort of the villager will be the best. And Kotalya also says when we talk of welfare, welfare of the children, welfare of the old, welfare of the invalid is the main concern. Now, Upanishads also have mentioned that every householder must practice charity. I mean, the social activity or promoting social activity, which is commonly known in the Indian society as a yagna, is very common. And when we talk of yagna, it means that common welfare of all, divide of the self-interest, that we do not think of ourselves or our benefits, 
we think of welfare of all and welfare of others. And therefore, if you look into the Indian ancient Indian history, yagna shalas were conducted and the purpose of yagna shalas was working for others, devoid of the self interest again. If you see Lord Krishna in Gita has particularly mentioned that the privileged section of the society must strive towards the fulfillment of their duty to serve others. In fact, Gita has said that I have no right to eat my food unless I ensure my neighbor gets the food and if he does not have, I must think for that. Similarly, if you look into the, the whole Indian society and traditional Indian society, traditional Indian society have a communitarian structure. When I say communitarian structure means that the institutions like joint family, extended family, now everybody is covered by everyone. I mean, uh, if you look into the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the role of the joint family and the village as a communitarian structure, all those who are have nots, all those who are poor, handicapped, aged, widows are taken care by the community itself, be that be the joint family or a village. Again, if you look into the concept of charity, concept of charity which is commonly known in Indian setting as dana, dana and again there is a relationship of punya and dana that you know uh, that you uh, this, the concept of dana has been institutionalized. In fact, I will go to the extent that if you look into the life cycle right from the birth of the child to the death of a man, dana is there to, is to be performed by a Indian family at all stage. The charity has been institutionalized and all members of the society must adhere to some sort of a dana at different stages of life. Now, similarly, the concept of dana is not only to the individual, particularly if you look into the advent of Buddhism in Indian society, we found that the institutional charity, people have started giving charity to the sanghas. Sanghas mean association and organizations. And there are so many uh, charitable organizations which came into being, which look after the relief of the blind or invalid or infirm or the aged or the widowed woman. Now, even we see the kings and emperors in India and again the impact of Buddhism, particularly I am referring to King Ashoka and Kanishka. Now, the kings have started thinking towards the happiness and the welfare of the people and they were all the time looking after different aspects of the welfare of the people like uh, rural development or welfare of the prisoners or even saying that the free uh, medical care to the people for in their, uh, in their areas or in their kingdoms. Now, that is what is the basically the ancient period. Now, if you see the medieval period, because this ancient period I am referring to was 2500 BC to AD 1000. Now, the medieval period started from 1200 AD to 1800 AD. Now, this is the medieval period and what we found that individual charity has been shifted to, it is not the charity has to be referred to only uh, individual. Here, you know, in this medieval period, particularly in the Muslim kings and Muslim sultanates, you know, that they were more concerned about the majority of the people or the community. Like, you know, they wanted to have maintain, uh, have peace in their region. They would like to uh, protect from uh, external forces, so they provide security to the subjects in their state or to provide justice, the concept of justice that the people must get 
their due share. And the Muslim religion, particularly the concept of zakat, that a part of their income must be shared with the community. And when they are referring to the community, and what sort of share? The share in terms of money, share in terms of cattle, share in terms of uh, their mercantiles or grain. Now, all these things have to be shared to the, uh, with the people uh, of the state. Now, if you see the Muslim kings again in the medieval period, a, a king like uh, Mayu was, uh, had done a pioneering work of prohibiting Sati Pratha. Akbar say for instance, Akbar the Great has played a very important role and his role was a very important reforms like abolition of slavery and this was way back in 1583. The equality of people irrespective of their caste and class and religion and the poor relief and Akbar has uh, uh, a comprehensive system of poor relief for the people. So, that is what are the main landmarks in the ancient and the medieval periods in the Indian history. Uh, thank you, Professor Kodi. It was quite interesting to listen to you about uh, the contribution made by various kings as well as the, the traces that we find in the religious scriptures that most of our people use in India. And this concept of helping others, of uh, going out of oneself to the majority community is still very much prevalent in our country. And uh, now, usually when we speak about the origin and growth of social work profession, we always look to the United States. Uh, we have uh, people like uh, Mary Richmond who initiated a uh, lot of work, especially with regard to working with the families and individuals. And uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Archana Dasi to uh, throw some light about uh, uh, the kind of initiation taken in the U.S. as far as the origin and growth of social work as a concept is concerned. When we really talk about the history of uh, you, uh, social work in uh, U.S., uh, we see that uh, English uh, poor law legislation and related developments, uh, they provided a background for the development of social work. Um, in uh, United States of America, well, in the uh, in the uh, in the last of the 19th century, um, U.S. experienced an increase in number of social problems, and uh, as a result of uh, rapid urbanization, industrialization, and uh, um, immigration, together with the massive growth of population. Uh, in response to these problems, there were three main social movements which uh, uh, took place in America, which were served as a basis for the uh, um, development of social work profession. And now these three movements were uh, charity organi uh, organization society, then the settlement house movement, and uh, the last was the child welfare movement. As far as the uh, charity organization movement uh, is concerned, it, it uh, started in 1877 in uh, Buffalo in New York and um, it was an English cleric uh, by the name of S. H. Gotin who uh, founded uh, um, COS that is charity organization society in uh, US. And uh, the movement uh, was so uh, such a welcome that in 15 years, uh, uh, we could see COS in 92 American cities. Now, uh, a, ma uh, a major difference here in the COS uh, movement in US was that a professional approach to the human problems that was adopted by uh, the COS uh, workers and a scientific uh, charity um, attitude was adopted where uh, one had to understand and cure poverty and family disorganization rather than just assisting the poor people. That was something which was different at this time in US. And uh, charity organization uh, society workers who were uh, largely women uh, of uh, US, they stressed on investigation, coordination and personal service uh, of the poor. 
and each case was considered individually and uh, that was assigned to what was uh, what they were called friendly visitors and uh, they, they, they used certain techniques at that point of time and they were uh, called uh, they were such as sympathy, such as tact, patience, wise advice, these were the kind of techniques which were used by those friendly visitors. Now, uh, the COS movement fostered the um, present family welfare agencies uh, such as family case work, school social work, family counselling, career counselling, these were the kind of things which started there. Uh, the second movement after the COS was the settlement house movement. Again, if we uh, recall, uh, the settlement house movement began in uh, England and uh, by Samuel uh, uh, Burnett and uh, the same model, the Toynbee Hall model was uh, being re replicated here and in Chicago, the Hull House uh, was started by Jane Adams and Ellen Gates Starr in 1889. Now, the settlement house movement uh, uh, was combined with social advocacy and social services. Now, uh, again here also the settlement house uh, workers were the young students from the universities and colleges and they established a neighborhood center uh, and offered services such as citizenship training, uh, adult education, counseling, recreation and daycare services. Now, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, settlement house workers, they believed that if they improve the neighborhood, this will in turn help in improving the community and which will in turn help in making a better society. That was the concept of the settlement house movement. Um, the uh, third movement was the child welfare movement and there were two org uh, societies which were established um, in New York again. One was the children's aid society and another was the society for the prevention of cruelty to children. These were the two societies which, which came up. And the main aim of the child welfare movement was to uh, rescue children from streets or from inadequate homes and find for them a wholesome living situation. These were the three movements which primarily contributed to the uh, rise of social work profession in US. And at the same time, uh, the seeds were being sown for the social work methods such as case work, group work and community organization. Well, uh, uh, you have uh, beautifully narrated the concept and its origin in the United States. Now, uh, Professor Kohli already told us uh, about uh, the growth of this concept uh, in the Indian context after the 18th century. Uh, later, we had uh, our own uh, struggle for independence and a uh, lot of uh, national leaders who came in to play their role of uh, uh, helping us in getting the independence, at the same time working for the welfare of the people. Now, Professor Kohli, can you narrate further about uh, uh, the uh, kind of uh, development of this concept uh, after the 18th century? Well, uh, I talked about uh, the ancient and the medieval period and now let us look into the, uh, the modern period what we call and this modern period uh, is 18. 100 AD onward. Now, this is the period where uh, we could see lot of changes in the Indian society. Because of the British uh, rule, there was a new legal system based on western ideas. There were new rules relating or the laws relating property rights. There were concept of rule of law which was introduced by the British in the society. The, there was the emergence of judiciary and emergence of market economy, which was a very important factors, you know. Apart from that, even uh, the change in the infrastructure, like there was a growth of communication, 
or the development of railway or the growth of educational system in this country have changed the whole uh, the structure of the society and the problems were taken differently by the social reformers during that time. Because what has been seen that this new system has an effect on the family, on the kinship, on the marriage and the caste. Therefore, a band of social reformer, what uh, has been said that they were also national leaders a person like Raja Ram Mohan Rai, a person like Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, Jyoti Rai Phule, Sasi Prada Banerjee, Gopal Krishna Gokhale in Maharashtra, Swami Dayanand in Punjab and Swami Vivekanand. Now all these reformers in the 19th century have done a tremendous work to reform the Indian social system and they have attacked all those practices which were obstacle in growth and development of the country. They have all worked or most of them have worked against caste, against child marriage, against a very bad practice which was in Bengal and other parts of the country was sati or widow re, widowhood as a problem was taken care. Many reformers have even attacked traditional religious practice like idol worship. Now all these were taken care of and uh, these social reformers have set up lot of uh, institutions and they have organized people to take action with reference to the problem which I have mentioned earlier. So, what we found during this modern period, a number of uh, movements were started like Brahmo Samaj was started in Bengal, Brahmo Samaj was initiated <laughs> by Raja Ramon Rai and Brahmo Samaj has taken a number of problems in that part of the country, Arya Samaj was initiated by uh, Saraswati Swami Dhyanand and he has done lot of work for education of the women in Punjab and the other part of the country. The Ramakrishna mission was started by uh, uh, our great uh, uh, leader like uh, Swami Vivekananda and they have contributed a lot or Indian Social Conference or Servants of People Society by uh, uh, Lokmanya Tilak and other reformers have done a lot of uh, 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 work in different part of the country. Now, the practice if I have to analyze you know the reform movement in this part of the history, what I found that most of these reformers were English speaking middle class people and they, they have learned from the British and they tried to reform the Indian scene. In fact, you know the end of the, uh, the, the, the 19th century and uh, the beginning of the 20th century what we found that a, a first uh, institution in social work education in 1936, uh, Sir Dorabji Tata Graduate School of Social Work was started in Bombay and that was the culmination point where uh, which concluded rather uh, taking care of the efforts made by the social reformer and put everything together to have social work as a profession. Thank you, Professor Kohli. Uh, we are already nearing to the you know, uh, end of uh, this particular uh, uh, session. Now, before uh, uh, we wind up, I will uh, just request Dr. Archana Dasi to tell us briefly in two minutes about uh, uh, the concept of uh, a profession, uh, social work as a profession. Uh, social work as a profession was contested a lot uh, abroad first because uh, it originated there first. 
So, they, they had a lot of discussion that what a profession is all about and then in 1957 uh, Greenwood came with uh, certain attributes of a profession and which, uh, which I will just now uh, discuss and which would and you would see that social work uh, definitely has all those attributes which, which makes it a profession. According to Greenwood, there were five attributes of a profession. The first one was that a profession should have a systematic body of knowledge and skills. The second thing which a profession should have is professional uh, authority in a client professional relationship which is based on the use of competence. The third thing is that there should be a, 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 a professional training um, and control in, uh, in its own membership. The fourth one is the code of ethics for the professionals uh, and the fifth is that there should be certain norms, values and a culture um, uh, which guides the profession and uh, creates an organizational network which regulates its functions. Now, if we see these attributes, they all fit into the social work also because social work has a body of knowledge, social work has certain code of ethics, social work has a professional authority over its client and social work also has a professional culture, certain norms and values which uh, gives it a professional status. Thank you Dr. Archana Das for uh, explaining to our students about uh, the concept of social work as a profession. Now, in this uh, uh, session, we have already seen about the uh, growth of uh, the concept of uh, social work as a profession from charity. We have also examined uh, how this concept grew in various continents and in particular uh, in India, UK and USA. I am sure with the kind of print material that is already available with you and the kind of discussion that has taken place now, you will be in a better position to understand the concept of uh, social work as a profession. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.